I love, it's like having a welcoming committee uh, every few blocks as you ride past or stop at all the, the breakfast stations. It's, it's just a really fun day. It, it feels good when there's more of you. Uh, it feels good yeah. when you're riding past people sitting in cars in traffic. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Amy Kenry of Denver, Colorado. And uh, we are gonna have a fabulous conversation about her activity as a crossing guard in safe routes to school activity and safe streets advocacy. Uh, let's get right to it, cause it's a long one. <laughs> Enjoy. Well, Amy, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Or thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Welcome. <laughs> welcome you to my. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome me. Office. Welcome you. <laughs> Amy, I'd love to have my guests just uh, uh, say a little bit about themselves. So who is Amy? I am a volunteer crossing guard for my kids elementary school. I'm a big safe routes to school advocate. Um, and I, I'm on the Mayor's Bicycle Advisory Committee here in Denver. I am the Denver Bike Mayor, and I have two kids, and uh, we live in West Wash Park in Denver. Fantastic. One of my favorite neighborhoods, actually. It's a good one. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 a, fun, it's a fun neighborhood, and, and uh, uh, for, for folks who aren't really familiar with Denver, uh, and, and particularly like some of the really rich historic neighborhoods. What's it, what's it like living in Denver? How long have you been there? My husband and I moved here from Washington, D.C. after September 11th. So we've been living out here almost 20 years, I suppose. We started in a neighborhood called Whittier, which is... Um, near where I saw you. I think we rode through that for that um, ride a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so West Wash Park is south of downtown. We moved down here because when I traveled on bike from Whittier all to the Santa Fe Arts District, where my office is, it was across every road, every major road in Denver is what I used to say. And so it was just, <laughs> it was too dangerous of a commute. So that's the, the main reason that we moved to this neighborhood. Um, uh, now my bike ride to work is a seven minute commute. So that's much nicer. Uh, West Wash Park is full of, I would say older, uh, mostly original homes that are roughly a hundred years old, Victorians and what we call Denver squares, things like that. Um, peppered with some, a little bit of density, but uh, there's, there's still a pretty good stronghold on single family dwellings here in West Wash Park. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, I, I'm going to actually, uh, uh, spring another surprise on you here. Um, and, and that is, I think it would be fun to play, uh, your little video that you have. The, which one? <laughs> the, there's basically the, who is Amy? Oh, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Let's plug this in. Cause what I like about this is it'll be very relevant to what we were just talking about uh, in terms of your neighborhood, because there's a really mm -hmm. nice a, you know, picture of you like going into your, your house on the, the front porch and that mm -hmm. kind of good mm -hmm. stuff. So, all right, let's give this a shot. My name is Amy Kenry, and I am a bike and community advocate. I um, live in West Wash Park. I've lived in Denver for almost 20 years now. And I didn't get involved in bike advocacy until I threw a bike rodeo uh, at my kids' elementary school. It was a free event. Who knows where the idea came from? Um, a bike rodeo is the most beautiful thing. And it's basically like a, um, a festival celebrating bicycling geared towards kids. There's a skills course. There's a rules of the road course. So there's kind of something for all ages. We usually have a food truck, um, helmet decorating station. It's really fun. Um, and we went out of our way to make sure that those kids um, who didn't have a bike or were planning to ride the bus home were able to participate. Maybe even better than the bike rodeo was the next few days because this is really the awakening point for me. The fact that that experience prompted so many more people to ride their bike really got me thinking like how many people are out there who would ride their bike but 
you know, there's some reason they're not. That's when I started paying attention to what's going on in the city and what's the city doing to make the streets safer or get more people on bikes. Around 2018, I started to um, attend neighborhood meetings. I'm the vice president of the West Wash Park Neighborhood Association. I'm also the co-chair of the Mayor's Bicycle Advisory Committee. I am a crossing guard. <laughs> That's a funny thing for me to talk about because I don't think people understand how great it is and how fun it is. I became a crossing guard because I just wanted to help out and I wanted to support the other crossing guard that was at our school. The more parent involvement we got with the crossing guard program at our school, all of a sudden other parents started to pay more attention because if the crossing guard that's holding up the stop sign in front of you, if you know that person, you're much more likely to be respectful. Come back. This really good we'll have supper this evening. There's a lot of dead time, so I bought a speaker. My playlist for Crossing Guard came about because it's boring out there waiting for the, the light to change, and um, kids love music. They suggest songs for me because I'm out of songs. Like even neighbors, I think, write on that that request sheet. I wish everyone realized how. I'm going to uh, go ahead and put, press pause on that now. And uh, folks, I am going to include the link uh, to that video um, in the show notes down below. So make sure that you go and watch the full video. It's fantastic. And it's it's really, really well done. It was done, I think it was published, what, a year ago? Is that correct? Yeah, I think about a year ago. That sounds right. Yeah. So looking back at that, and I don't know how frequently you, you watch it, um, and it hasn't been watched by very many people. It's, it's like less than 200 views right now. Um, when you go back and look at that, what comes to mind? What, you know, what emotions or, or things, you know, uh, bubble up for you when you see that? Oh, gosh. I mean, <clears throat> it, it makes me feel really good. Uh, um, sometimes you know, you get so buried in working on all these little projects and, um, and then when you step back and see them all listed out, it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, I, I didn't realize, I guess, uh, all the, all the stuff I have going on because I just have my head down, um, trying to, trying to make a difference and do what I can. I feel that, I've ended up, I have always been a very, in a very privileged situation and I don't want to waste that. So therefore I just don't sit down um, and I do what I can do. And it's, it does, it feels good when I see that uh, video and I, and I love the crossing guard bit because that's close to my heart and it, it really brings me joy every day. Yeah. Yeah. It just keeps giving. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those so, kids, yeah. I was going to say, so what do you end you. up doing? What do you end up doing in the summertime when you're not needing to do as many uh, crossing uh, guard activities? Um, well, I sleep in about half an hour each day. So that's nice. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do own a graphic design business. So I uh, put, maybe put a little bit more energy into that. Um, and I spend time with my kids. They are nine and 14. So, um, I understand that pretty soon they may not want to spend as much time with me. So, uh, we like to do a lot of camping in the summer and mountain biking and, uh, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we have an image here on screen right now, which is, uh, you, you just explained to me is sort of the parade portion of the bike rodeo. Uh, and is this the, the school where your, your kids uh, go to school? Yeah, my youngest still goes here okay. and my oldest went there from age three to all the way through sixth grade. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And for, for those who may not be familiar with what a bike rodeo is, we saw a little bit of it on, on the video there. Uh, can you sort of explain that, especially since this is a global audience and they may not have ever heard that term before? What is a, what is a bike rodeo? <laughs> um, well, it is a festival celebrating biking. Like I said on the video, um, some kids call it bike Christmas. And um, what it is, is <clears throat> a bunch of different stations 
uh, set up on our school playground. Uh, this one right here we're looking at is the start of the rules of the road station where kids um, learn their hand signals. And then this is for younger kids. They can um, head out the playground gate, down the sidewalk, a block, through an alley, um, up the sidewalk. They're uh, Along the way, they are intercepted by volunteers who ask them to stop and show their hand signals or sometimes stop because maybe a, a driver is coming through the alley. Um, but there's something for everyone. This is a, a wave of our parades, which go every 15 minutes. Um, I work with the local uh, police officers and they help me uh, shut down six blocks around the school to drivers. And every 15 minutes, we have a parade wave go through. And I think some of the older kids especially love that because when do you, as a kid uh, or an adult, when do you get to ride on an open street like that um, and, and not have to worry as much about being hit by a car? Occasionally, we have a, a kid hit a parked car, but um, yeah. <laughs> you know uh, yeah. that requires a Band-Aid and a, a, an ice cream cone and it's... Right all good. Um, yeah. Also, Bike Rodeo has um, a skills course set up. We have helmet decorating, which is what we're looking at right here. This is really popular with the youngest kids, and a lot of the materials are, are pretty easy to come by. That's uh, homemade uh, pom-poms made out of yarn. Um, kids use ribbon, uh, puffy stickers to decorate their bikes, and uh, chalk markers are really helpful for the helmet um, decorating because that stuff comes off. And there's some little uh, plastic pieces that you can put on your spokes there. Um, that's a really popular station. And let's see, what are the other? Uh, there's bike obstacle courses, um, which you probably are going to eventually come to in this slideshow. But parents make obstacles out of uh, homemade, you know, extra scraps of wood, um, things like that. So we have teeter-totters and ramps, about eight of those set up in the field. Bike Rodeo also has a slow race, which is slowest rider wins. That's, that's fun. And we have a food truck. We have a borrow a bike station that's important so that everyone can participate. Not everyone has access to a bike or is able to get their bike to school. Also siblings participate and sometimes they don't have a bike. Um, and then one of the most important parts of the bike rodeo is the um, fix it station. We have a local bike shop, Campus Cycles, come and donate all of the supplies and um, they bring two people and just do nonstop tire fixes, brake fixes, um, they're, you know, adjusting the seat, the simple, simple things like adjusting the seat or adjusting, making sure, um, there's nothing dangly, uh, mostly tire fixes, I guess, but it's, it may seem insignificant, like that's an easy thing, but it's a big barrier for a lot of kids. They just don't have a, access to a bike tune up. So we love having campus cycles there to, to donate those um, services and the materials for that. And I, th I think that's all of the, I think I went through all of the stations of the bike rodeo. And I'm pausing on this because uh, one of my next questions is really, uh, because uh, again, the part of the, the reason why we do bike rodeos, the reason why we do the bike safety education classes, I used to lead them uh, for fourth graders uh, on the Big Island in Hawaii. Um, I'm wearing my Aloha shirt today in nice. honor of nice. uh, the decade that I spent uh, there on the Big Island, um, wow. was, was is to really sort of normalize, uh, you know, help kids with the skills, but then also um, attempt to normalize that concept of walking and biking to school. And so we see the, the banner here, the bike to school. And I was just marveling at some of the images here. Um, obviously, this was part of the special day, but at the same time, I'm seeing some really in interesting infrastructure that seems to be in place here. We've got a bike corral here uh, right by the school. Um, another image of that as well. But then 
this is the bike rack at the school. And so this really indicates to me that there's some intentionality here in terms of infrastructure that's being provided for at the school. And it reminds me of just up the road in Boulder, uh, which I'm very familiar with. I lived in Boulder for over a decade and just about a decade, actually, um, is that, you know, there's tremendous numbers of, of kids that ride to school um, especially, you know, at the elementary school level. And then again, at uh, middle school and in high school still, which is what we really want to see as a society is, you know, kids and parents feeling like it's safe and inviting for them to be able to get to school and, and have a safe place to lock up. So I'm, I, I'm just grinning ear to ear when I see this, this image here. Yeah, um, this is the, this bike rack in particular came about because of the culture that we've been working on building at the elementary school for the past six or seven years. And there's a lot of a lot of volunteers needed for the bike rodeo. And um, I think that has piqued a lot of parents interest in biking to school throughout the year. And um, at a PTSA meeting, someone said, we need more bike parking. And um so we reached out to the school district and they had this in some junkyard, you know, it's a, re, it's a reused bike rack, but, um, it's in a great spot in the shade, uh, back in the corner of the playground. So, um, the kids that go in the doors on either side of this bike rack really get a lot of good use out of that. But you're right. I mean, giving people that infrastructure, that, um, signal that, Hey, this is for you and you are welcome here. That does make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, you know, you had mentioned you started off by talking a little bit about how uh, and in the, the, the video there uh, of, of how you became aware of and became passionate about safe routes to school. Um, how many years ago was that now? I think that was around 2017. OK, OK. Yeah. And. Still passionate, still on board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just building that. Yeah. That in 2017, um, when we threw our first bike rodeo, I had no idea what a difference that would make uh, the days after the bike rodeo. And uh, I mean, prior to that, I just assumed that if people wanted to ride their bike, they would be because I wanted to ride my bike. And so I did, but I had this confidence built up from years of doing, I lived without a car when I was in Washington, DC for five years. And, um, it was just a, a no brainer to me to use my bike to get around or use the bus to get around. Um, I preferred that to driving, right. but, um, I, I, I guess I didn't realize the impact that car culture has had on a lot of people. Um, and since then I've realized that, you know, that there's a variety of reasons why people aren't out there riding their bikes. But, um, one huge reason is they don't have a safe place to ride. And I, I thought, well, if I can make, if I can help move the needle on that, then that's where I'm going to focus my energy. And then I realized what a big impact that, uh, kids have on the rest of the family. Right when the kids get out there and ride, then the whole family is going to get out there and ride with yeah. them. So, um, it also just side note here in Denver, um, about 25% of our rush hour traffic is due to people driving their kids to school. Right. So if we got more kids biking and walking and taking the bus to school, then that would make, it would make an incredible difference for our city. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when we think back to, uh, the olden days, <laughs> you know, <laughs> before it became customary for parents to be driving their kids to school. I mean, you know, it wasn't very long ago, generations, you know, prior. I mean, yeah, we, we all walked to school. I mean, that, I mean, the neighborhood schools were just that they were neighborhood schools. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the, the very, very, um, you, you mentioned your privilege to be able to live in the community that you live in. And, and that is one of the things that is wonderful about that Wash Park area is that you still do have local elementary schools and local schools that, you know, that kids are able to still be able to walk to and bike to. Um, 
you had mentioned that, you know, we just recently saw each other uh, just a couple of weeks ago at the Ride for Racial Justice. And Marcus and I were talking about this on on bike and in, in, in the on bike interview and and talking about how he remembers being able to you know walk and bike to elementary school, middle school and also high school. Uh, in fact, we rolled past both his middle school and his his high school. He went to East <laughs> High. Um, yeah. And so it's I think it's like reestablishing that that habit and that, that muscle that, oh yeah, we can walk and bike to school if it becomes a safer environment. And that's where the crossing guard activity sort of, you know, starts to, to kick in as well as the safe routes to, to, to school and the other mm-hmm. initiatives and programs. Um, we're seeing a lot of activity here. What, what's going on in this particular photo? <laughs> Well, at some point I thought, um, wow, this is making a difference at my own school and I should, if I'm doing it here, I should do it at other schools, just do the same thing. Um, so let's see in 2021, I believe for the walk to school, well, traditionally what was called walk to school, I think now it's both, uh, walk and roll to school twice a year, but I did a raffle at our own elementary school for kids that were walking or biking that day and you could win like lunch with the principal or a a Target gift card. I got a little, I got a micro grant from um, the city. We have a nice micro grant uh, program here in Denver. And I used that to replicate what I was doing at my school at five different schools um, between the connections I had across the city. And I thought, okay, that worked all right. So what else, what else can I do? And I always talk about how I feel like a celebrity every day when um, I am when I'm out there as a crossing guard because kids and parents and caregivers, almost everyone that passes through almost every time says, thank you, Miss Amy. And it really makes me feel like I'm making a difference. So I came up with this idea. Maybe it was my husband's idea. I'm not sure who's. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim it um, for Celebrity Crossing Guard. So what you're looking at here is a project that just was, it's probably my favorite project, I think, uh, that I've worked on. Um, and we had 20 schools, about 20 schools participate. This is um, the epic Dixie Crystals um, handing out raffle tickets to the kids that walked to Lincoln Elementary. So um, 20 schools, I paired a local celebrity with a crossing guard at each school. And so um, we were lucky to have Dixie, but we also got uh, the majority of the city council members in Denver to do it. Um, I made them all these, well, I put uh, letters on the back of their vests with their name in sparkly letters, uh, sort of in a, like a football jersey type of way. So we had city council members. We had uh, a couple of state representatives. We had our um, Senator John Hickenlooper do it. We had the DPS superintendent, um, some local musicians, uh, local slash national musicians and DJs. It it turned out better than I dreamed it could. Um, And it checked so many boxes. One of the biggest things I was after was um, trying to get people interested in becoming a crossing guard. I've seen how it has made a huge difference um, for my own intersection. I've seen the number of kids double uh, coming across my intersection since I started there. Uh, One of the things we did here with Celebrity Crossing Guard was make sure that whatever language um, was spoken at the schools, that the artwork, the posters, and the social media content was translated into that language. So I think there were, I don't know how many different languages we ended up doing, but some of them I had a little bit of trouble with because I hadn't actually heard of that language before. But I think there's there's somewhere between 15 and 20 languages um, spoken in DPS. So I, I was really proud to be able to, I have those skills because I'm a graphic designer, to be able to translate. Um, well, not to translate myself, but to create the, use the translations to create different language languages. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. And, and you had mentioned like helping to recruit, uh, you know, your people to, to do this. And recently we, uh, I just had, uh, Nicole McSpirit on, 
uh, the, the the podcast, and she's now a, a, a crossing guard. She just uh, finished up her first year, and she's excited about next year. Uh, was she one of your recruits? I don't know if she got the idea from me or not, but uh, I sure really love having her as a partner in crime. There's a there's yet another local bike and pedestrian advocate, Allison Torbic, that ha- has right. uh, joined the ranks too. And so we every once in a while we get together with a, a few other crossing guards um, for a happy hour or or a coffee or something like that. And it's really it's really cool to have uh, somebody to uh, to complain to and and laugh with um oh speaking of laughing with yeah i have a cone costume so i gotta break that out um here we've got uh on the right the far right we have debbie ortega who was running for mayor and had been a long long time um city council person at large uh this is at eagleton elementary and we have the principal i think on the left and the um one of their uh deans there in the middle um, they were super excited to have Debbie there that day. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> and and why not have some fun with it, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what, when you're talking about advocating um, with kids, that's what you got to do is make it fun. Everybody, that that's what brings people out is when it's fun, especially when you're working with kids. Yeah, yeah. So, Obviously, you know, one of the things that you did was was get engaged and and, and start you stepped up. You said, you know, hey, I I'll, I'll do this. I can do this. I'll be a crossing guard. I've, I, you know, I've got a little bit of flexibility in my time. I can do this. I can, you know, do this before I need to head off to my graphic design work. And it, it sounds like it's been very rewarding for you. You're continuing to do this. You're continuing to stay engaged with the, the bicycle rodeo. When did you also start getting engaged in, uh, involved in just overall safer streets advocacy work? Oh, I mean, one thing leads to another. I would say the tipping point for me was when um, I got wind that some neighbors in along Marion Parkway were objecting to a protected bike lane in front of a a school. And I thought, well, that's crazy. Why, why would you, um, that, that does not make any sense at all to me. I've never heard of anybody objecting to a bike lane, especially in front of a school. Didn't make sense. Uh, So I started to stick my nose into that in a way that I don't know many people are ballsy enough to do, which, which meant meeting with the opposition I crossed the I crossed the picket line, and I went behind the scenes, and um, I went into the condo building that had created a petition to stop this protected bike lane along what they considered their street. So let's set let's set this up a little bit. We're we're looking at an overhead image here, um, and hopefully, if I've planned this out right, it's a it's a relevant overhead image. What are we looking at? Um, this is butterflies stenciled onto the street in the spot where Alexis Bounds was hit and killed by a driver. And, and that event that took place, I think this is with the, the one year anniversary of, of her, her death. Is that correct? Yeah, this was to celebrate the, um, one year anniversary, one, well, I guess not celebrate, but, um, right. Mark the one-year anniversary. Yeah, uh, memorial. They call attention died. too, and so that that was part of the call to action. And this is how you and I got connected in social media. I was, uh, you know, keeping you know aware of what was going on. My time that I lived in in Boulder, um, I actually worked in downtown Denver for two years uh, during my decade that I lived in Boulder. I would just ride the. Um, the, what used to be called the Boulder Express down now is called the Flatirons Flyer uh, down from, from Boulder to, to downtown Denver. And, and it's one of the reasons why I'm so aware of, of the Denver neighborhoods. And so even though I haven't been there since 2004 in terms of living you know, in, in Colorado, I, I, I try to stay on top of everything that's, that's happening there. And so I caught wind of this, you know, situation that was emerging, which is exactly what you were explaining, was this seemingly baffling resistance 
to making a safer street, a street that the call to action from the community, from you all, was that, hey, we've got a problem here. We need safer streets. And Alexis's unfortunate and tragic death is a great illustration as to why we need safer streets. Yeah. I mean, Alexis, so that happened, her death happened in July, but the opposition to the bike infrastructure started months and months before. Mm -hmm. And the horrific thing is even after she died, they continued to stick to their messaging, which is it's not needed. Um, These are Alexis's sons helping us paint and um, stencil on the sidewalk um, in preparation for that day, the commemoration of her one year death, which was just about as heartbreaking as, um, I, I just can't, I, it was really difficult to, to watch that, um, to watch them come and help us. Uh, this is a picture of David Chen and Molly McKinley who were, um, organizing this with me. We really worked as a team and everyone had their, their strengths. Um, this was 2020, July, 2020. So you, you can see, even though it was super hot, we were, um, masked up at this point outside. That's David's cargo bike that he brought all kinds of stuff, um, <laughs> stuff on brooms and, um, heavy ladders, uh, to hang the lanterns and in, in the trees, but it took us three days to, to paint the street. Um, and then we had a, a ride, um, uh, some speeches by Teddy. I think this is Teddy on the right. Um, that's Alexis's husband giving this. Oh, no, that's David. Sorry, my, my eyes are. Uh, but Teddy did speak and then David spoke. David got, a, um, got the city to put a bench in um, in memory of Alexis and also the sign um, in memory of Alexis Bounds. So. It, and you're and you're right. I mean, this continued on a year later in in, in 2021. You know, here we are. It's still <laughs> it's still going on. You guys are still working through this. And and this little flyer says, "Cyclist voices needed." And really, I I whenever I see something like this, I I I would really try to caution folks. Broaden the tent. It shouldn't just be cyclist voices are needed. It's like everybody's voice is needed. We need safer streets for everybody. And oh, by the way, this protected bike lane will help make it safer for everyone. Not only people riding bikes, but also people who are pedestrians, because what we're trying to do is traffic calm. We're trying to slow down the motor vehicle traffic. Yeah, yeah. Um, So this was... Uh, yeah, we did kind of hit it from all angles that the flyer that um, you had up, that was something that we specifically gave to cyclists and taped on to bikes. Um, so, uh, but looking back, you're right. Messaging could have been tweaked a little bit. Um, when I spoke to audiences like this, this is um, a, a neighborhood association meeting in East Wash Park, uh, the neighborhood association that um, the the neighbors that were opposing the project lived in. Um, that was definitely what I tried to get across was this was this project would benefit everybody. Oh yeah, the, some of these things I forget about. Um, the Pro Wash Park profile did did a ride. I don't know who like how these things happen um, or how I get wrapped up in them, but uh, I this is another example of using my kids as a kind of yeah. like advocacy ammunition um because when you see a kid i know i know you i mean i always talk about how kids are unpredictable and um i mean how else am i going to teach my then i don't know how old he was then nine maybe um how else is he going to learn the rules of the road and um how to eventually ride his bike to middle school and high school. Um, right. it, it's not as intuitive as you think. If you have not been through driver's ed, you haven't had that experience of being in a car and not being able to see because your blo- your view is blocked or just being in a hurry and uh, just not paying attention. You, yeah. you, you need, you need kids to, to learn how to ride in the road and, um, and you want people of all ages to be able to ride on the road. So yeah. uh, I, I use my kids all of the time. If I'm going to be on the news I to do an interview, I bring my kids with me yeah. for sure. 
Yeah, I love it. Well, and that's and and the, and the relevance to that is that what we're talking about is creating an environment which is appropriate for all ages and abilities, and uh, and that's exactly what I want to illustrate here. Is uh, I'll press play on this. Video. And you can talk a little bit about the conditions. Now, this is from last summer um, when I was in town to film uh, the interviews for the uh, Denver uh, e-bike incentive program. I was doing that for Bicycle Colorado. And so I had a chance uh, uh, to go out and ride the the facility because I, I wanted to see it. And so this is circa last summer, last fall, September or last fall. Um, I don't know if anything has changed. Um but walk us through, because this is the end result. It did happen. Um, you were able to overcome the resistance, and now you have an all ages and abilities facility. It's got to be gratifying to see how far this has come. Yeah, uh, 100%. Uh, this was one of the first protected um, concrete barrier bike lanes in Denver. And um, I'm hoping that the people that oppose this infrastructure before now see so many more people riding the street. And um, you can see even people that are walking and, and running end up using the street. A lot of times I see strollers in the bike lane, which doesn't bother me at all. There is a walking path on the um, to the right and a sidewalk uh, further off on the left. Um, but yeah, I think it turned out great. Uh, there's, uh, I, I can see that Denver is um, working on continuously improving the design of the protected uh, bike lanes throughout the city. I personally wish these barriers were a little bit um, taller or harder to roll over with your tires um, because drivers that are dropping off kids at Steel Elementary, which is just past this light on the um, left side of the screen. You can kind of see the sign for it there. But on the other side, uh, coming up the other direction, a lot of times drivers will pull over, uh, roll their tires over the, the concrete barrier and drop off their kids, which, funny side note, there, a couple of years ago, there was a parent there and this this was just so fantastic. He made these signs that were, um, they said, they looked like city signs. They were metal and they had the, they're on these metal posts. And they said, reserved parking for the lazy and selfish. <laughs> and he, he put like four of them along the, in the grass median along at like where people were using the bike lane as a parking lane to drop off their kids. And um, I, the bike advocacy community just like loved it. And I happened to run into this guy at a Whole Foods bike rack and I was like, it's you, it's you. And then he moved away and I don't know his name, but he's, he's famous to me. Um, yeah. One of the, the reason these barriers though are not more substantial is because uh, we have quite large fire trucks in Denver that um, uh, the fire department is, a little bit, in my opinion, more conservative than I would like. Right. Yeah. And we'll, we'll pause here just for a second to, to talk a little bit about what some of the resistance was, um, because I think it's, it, it is helpful to try to understand. You had mentioned that you, you decided to, to like, infiltrate <laughs> the enemy oh, yeah. and, 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 and better, but, but more importantly, um, have an opportunity to be empathetic and try to understand what the resistance really was. Um, can, can you kind of share what it was, you know, some of the things that they were concerned about and, uh, and, and, and really help, help, help us understand. I, when it came down to it, their main concern was visual. Um, they thought that it would be ugly. Uh, so, so the very first thing that comes to mind when you, you talk about aesthetics and the resistance to it, we hear it uh, globally, all all across the, the the world. Here is oh, those ugly plastic sticks. <laughs> They're talking about the flex posts, and we see one flex post here uh, in in the visual. Was that one of the resistance? Was you know, those are ugly plastic sticks? We don't want those. Yeah, a hundred percent. They really use the historic preservation argument. This parkway has a historic does it, It's a historic parkway, and they were sending 
uh, open records requests to the city. They were pulling up these documents that preserve that officially preserved the parkway, not the street, by the way. They were confusing. They thought that the entire the grass and like the entire right of way was included in this historic preservation. And unfortunately, they, they uh, I think they were, they should have been maybe a little bit more strategic in their arguing for historic preservation because what ended up happening, I thought this was pretty funny. Um, Channel 9, Kyle Clark, did a bit on this and he pointed out that they're not arguing, they don't, what they don't want They don't want historic preservation because he showed a picture of the street a hundred and some years ago where it was, you know, it was dirt and there were horse and buggies. There are no vehicles on the street at all. What he said they wanted was preservation of the present, not preservation of, of history. So I thought that was really poignant. I think that's really, really important to pause and, 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 and talk about because that's exactly what we end up seeing when we see the resistance to change, when we see not in my backyard, not in my front yard, don't change the streetscape. It's it's a bit of a fear of the unknown. It's a bit of trying to preserve the status quo of what we have now because you know we, be, you know, society, the, the people that are, are living in this area, it's what we're used to. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, let's let's kind of keep it hit as it is. The irony, of course, is, yeah, if you really want to look at the historical context, yeah, these weren't even paved roads. You know, that's how old this really is. The automobiles are actually the interlopers. The automobiles are actually the thing that is degrading the livability and the quality of the environment, not the other yeah. way around, not people, not people walking, biking, mm-hmm. or riding horses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I wish that I could uh, explain all that uh, to people when they when they have those objections to change. Um, when they're scared like that, um, I wish that I could sit them down and say, do you realize, <laughs> do you, do, like, let's take a step back, like you said, and and understand how, how did we get here? And what has it done to our communities and our, our planet? Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the narratives that came about, and I think it's positive to have these arguments and these, these, these challenges, is that it helps us have a better understanding of what's truly important. And I'm scanning, I'm looking at the parking that is still available here on the street. And we're looking at the, the fact that there's still plenty of, of, of space for people to be able to drive through this area. They're just going to do so most, more slowly, more carefully. It becomes a more welcoming environment for everybody. And again, all ages and abilities. And, but one of the narratives that that did come about and is important for us to come about is to have this discussion of what is more important, the health and safety of people (laughs) walking, biking and driving, uh, or the preservation of aesthetics or the preservation of, uh, of parking or the preservation of being able to drive through an area as fast as possible. Um, I mean, we can see that, you know, that was a 20 mile per hour sign right there. This is not an area where, you know, you should be imagining that, yeah, you're going to be able to, to drive through as fast as possible. What's really, really interesting is that oftentimes some of the people who um, end up resisting change and resisting these types of infrastructure, one of the things that they talk about is uh, that when you say, well, what what would you like to see change or what what would you like to you know, if if you could w- wave a magic wand and make your street, you know, more welcoming, what would it be? And this is, well, people are just speeding. They're going too fast. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? well, it's like, oh, hey, have I have I got a plan for you? Because, hey, this is <laughs> we've got common ground here. <laughs> yeah, I love to find the common ground. I think that is really helpful when you're talking to people who have opposite views as you, um, not just, you know, talking about bike lanes, but all kinds of situations, because oftentimes you do find that 
everybody wants something similar. Um, and, and, um, we get so hung up on, you know, you know, the same thing has happened on Broadway, a few streets over, um, a bike lane is a protected bike lane has been going in there for, um, the past year or so they're still working on it, but we need to understand that that's going to, that it's for, it's going to improve that project isn't just for bikes. It's for pedestrians. The city is also working on the drainage underneath. They're replacing uh, the signals there. Uh, it's going to make it better for everyone who uses that street. I, and I, I hope that some of the people that live, that these are the towers that you're panning over to here where the petition, the epicenter of the petition. Oh, see, um, I didn't even know that. I, I was just oh, intuitively yeah. doing that. So there you go. Oh man, I, I spent too much time probably up in the, on the 15th floor there at someone's kitchen table with, with, uh, with the organizers of the petition, just mostly listening, um, asking them questions to try to find common ground, showing them that I am a human being. I'm not some, you know, I'm not what they envision as a cyclist, which uh, would be somebody in spandex on a road bike that's going 25 miles an hour down their street. I, I tried as best I could when they, when they would say, we would look out off the balcony and they would say, see that, see, see that, uh, bike. They didn't even that bike. They didn't even stop at the stop sign. And at the same time, there were cars drivers doing the same thing. And so I would nicely try to point out, look at that. Both modes are doing that. Right. Right. Who yeah. who's at risk here? Yeah. Um, who's which, the more which vulnerable? interestingly too? I mean, I don't know if the the safety stop law had passed by then, but. Uh, Earlier in this video, um, uh, you know, astute viewers would notice that, you know, I was stopped at the stoplight. I did eventually go through that intersection and when it was safe for me to go, do so. It was still red at the time, but although I, it did turn green um, by the time I was halfway across. But yeah, now the Colorado safety stop law is in place, which means that people who are riding a bike must treat a, a stop sign like a yield sign and, and treat a stop light like a stop sign and only proceed to go forward when it's safe to do so. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that too, is that there's that, that stereotype of who rides a bike. And unfortunately, that stereotype for too long in North America in particular has been, you know, the mammal. It's like me, you know, the middle-aged dude who's on his racing bike wearing Lycra, Lycra you know, that that's what mammal, by the way, stands for folks, mi middle, middle-aged uh, man in Lycra. And, and so it's important to understand that, no, 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 no. What we're really talking about here is a safer, more inviting environment for, for everyone walking or biking and driving, using transit. What we're really talking about here is, is quality of life and livability. Yeah. And, and along with that, a lot of misconceptions out there, such as all, all cyclists run, run stop signs. Um, like you mentioned, it's, it's now okay to, um, in the way that you described run a stop sign as a cyclist here in Denver. But when I did hear those, those false, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is when I heard people say things that were not accurate, I tried to correct them. And, um, I always tell people that are getting into advocacy to find your, use the skills that you have to, um, to advocate for, uh, like combine biking and if you're a writer, combine those two things. I'm a graphic designer. I use that in my advocacy. A friend of mine is um, really good at research. So I, I had these facts I could pull out of my head when they would say, oh, look at that uh, person running the stop sign on the bike. Well, they would say, look at the cycle, look at that bike run the stop sign. Um, I, I would say, well, actually, uh, cyclists and drivers break the law at the same rate. And here's my source. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I, I was paused on this just because I wanted to give some love to this hardworking little machine here. This is actually, I, I, I caught the, uh, the, the, the bike lane uh, sweeper, sweeper in action. Uh-huh. Yeah. Beloved yeah, these so little cute. guys are. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you have folks who may be tuning in to this. So why, are, why the fascination of, over that is that um, protected bikeways like this um, oftentimes get a lot of debris that sort of gathers in there. So having the ability to have the appropriate machinery for appropriate maintenance to be able to, to, to sweep up that debris, especially if there's some broken glass uh, and things of that nature, really does help uh, make the overall environment that much safer for, for the families that are riding on, on this as well as yeah. the, uh, yeah. the recreational cyclists. And they have the, the mini snow plows also yes. that come through. Yeah. Love those. I, I, I had to tell you that, um, A, I, I went out of my way to, to, to ride this, like I said, and film this and, and be able to do this. And this is the reason why it made me so happy to see it, is it just really exemplified when you see people walking and biking in this environment and you see how much safer it is for families to be able to do this. Um, it's unfortunate that you know, a tragedy had to happen or it did happen. And, and, but it's, it's wonderful and gratifying to see that, you know, you all who fought so hard to get this in place and on the ground, uh, to, to be able to see it come to, to fruition. Um, yeah, yeah. it was really a, a group effort. And my first uh, brush with the Denver bicycle, uh, advocacy community, Denver Bicycle Lobby, mainly organized that group. And um, it's a great group here in Denver. I, I just, there's so much support. There's always somebody that, um, I mean, people, I, I love that it's, they, they work with zero budget. They have zero employees. Yet when um, something like this happens, they, they show up and, um, uh, people come out of the woodwork to, to show support because it's sad to say, but you you do need to do that sometimes to show show the city or show the rest of the community that uh, we do exist. And people do care passionately um, about you know safe street infrastructure, and uh, you can't let you can't be drowned out by the uh, people who are resistant to change. Yeah. And I have the website up here. Um, again, it's DenverBicycleLobby.com. And they really filled a, a gap that existed. Um, they came into existence a, a few years ago, um, right about the time that, you know, the uh, bicycle, or the, the the Denver Bicycle Group was kind of like, uh, you know, waning a little bit and, and peep had been with them for a little bit before going and joining bicycle Colorado. And, uh, of course then, um, then Jill kind of went over to the, um, uh, the streets partnership and it becomes more of a, a what I like to, to, to advocate for from a, a true advocacy organization is make your advocacy organization with a broad tent, be able to, 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 you know, represent walking, biking and disability and, you know, AARP and everything. Make that a a broad partnership, uh, very, very strategic on Denver's um, uh, half. And and I'm glad to see that. We had the same thing happen here in Austin where, um, you know, Bike Austin was was sort of waning, Walk Austin was sort of waning. And the new uh, Vision Zero group, uh, you know, advocacy group was sort of waning. It's hard to keep the, the, the momentum of volunteers again, volunteers, uh, you get burnt out. And so they pulled together, um, pulled to get forces together to create the safer streets, Austin, uh, coalition. And so now it's a broader tent, but I do advocate for also saying that, you know, when you have activist organizations, which is what I really consider, um, the Denver bicycle lobby is, you know, where you don't, you're not necessarily, it's a difference. There's a difference between an advocacy organization that needs to be able to work well with uh, city governments and, and, and organizations and municipalities versus activist organizations, which are like, no, we're going to call you out. We're going to organize a, a critical mass. We're going to do a die-in. We're going, we're, we, we don't have any paid employees. It's us. We're the people. So. 
Yeah, yeah, they are. I, I agree with that. They are more activists for sure, which I think you need, you need advocacy and you need activism. Exactly. Um, I would love to, to do a, just a minute campaign. I think that's what it is, right? It's called just a minute <laughs> hashtag, just a minute. Uh, have you heard of that? I have. Yeah. Yeah. But tell yeah, more. I would yeah, love more. to do that. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I don't know that much about it, but I, I did listen to, um, the person I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but someone in San Francisco, I think is where it started, where there was a, a, a bike lane that was constantly blocked by drivers that would be just a minute, just a minute. And so they, a, a team went out in yellow t-shirts with a megaphone and um, they would, when a, the bike lane was blocked by a driver, they would uh, hold up traffic, car traffic so that bicyclists could go around the driver and they would, they would say just a minute, just, it's just going to be a minute. No, they were so nice about it. So nice. It, it, it's no big deal. Um, no big deal. The driver will be right back. Um, I'd love to do that in Denver. So I, I see, I see that in uh, the future here. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> and, 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 and really, I think it's, it, it's one of the, the neat things that sort of came about o- over the past, uh, you know, couple of years and here here's the uh, Valencia yeah. Street in San Francisco uh, the the just just a minute uh, campaign um, here and and r- really it's it, yeah and really it's it's bringing forth this concept of you know we see it all the time is that the life the health and safety and lives of people riding bikes are compromised so that cars will go ahead and 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 you know park in and block the, the the space. And so what this group of volunteers is, is really demonstrating and doing here is in through a guerrilla advocacy or a guerrilla activism movement. Yes, a guerrilla activism movement is is to say, oh, yeah, well, you know, hey, it's, it'll be just a minute, just, just yeah. a minute. So it's, it's great because <laughs> awesome. it's so tongue in cheek and snarky and but it it really brings forward the car brain mentality that that we have in our society where it's okay to 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 inconvenience and potentially uh endanger the lives of somebody who is walking or biking or in a wheelchair um but oh gosh for you know god forbid we can't we can't inconvenience people in cars we can't actually slow the, the traffic down. And, and so that's why this was uh, such a wonderful uh, activism movement. Yeah. I even, uh, speaking of inconveni- inconveniencing drivers, uh, this year I, um, I might have crossed the line when I was uh, doing my crossing guard duty with one of the parents coming through on uh, in a vehicle. He was very irritated that he missed a light signal a light cycle um to bring his child across to uh where the school is and um i may you know he missed it because there are pedestrians in the crosswalk and somebody needed to turn another driver wanted to to turn and they couldn't turn because people i me and the kids were in the crosswalk so he got real irritated and i ended up blowing my whistle at him and he parked his car and he came back and we had a little conversation um he followed me through the crosswalk back and forth. He's from the East coast. So his style of, um, conversation was more like yelling right. uh, to, and some of the other parents ended up calling the principal and she came walking down the block to make sure everything was okay. But by that time I had talked him through it. Um, and, uh, he was yelling at me. It's not fair. I need to hold back the pedestrians and let the, let the cars go through. And well, I said, I know you live in, in, Baker, which is the next neighborhood over, and your child is in sixth grade. Um, why doesn't he walk to school? It, a lot, all these other people are walking to school. Why, why doesn't he? Because I was laying a trap for him. And um, the parent said, well, he would have to cross. He named all these big streets. And I was, he said, yeah, it's not that far. It's like a mile and a half, but he it's not safe for him. And I was like, you're right. It's not safe for him. That's why I'm out here. And uh, the conversation really took a turn and he ended up apologizing to me. And I thought that was a really hard conversation. I probably crossed the line. um, But uh, I wish that I could have more of those conversations with drivers who 
yell this or that out their window when I'm walking or biking because they feel like it's not fair or they deserve this space more than I do. Um, I wish I could have those longer conversations, even though they're tough. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you had that conversation though, too, because, you know, it, 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 it is important to, um, to have those conversations. And especially if you can have those conversations face to face, um, and, and be able to work through that, uh, that quote unquote issue. And, uh, little did he know that you had a little bit of East coast, uh, experience of your own. So (laughs) you weren't going to be, you you weren't going to be as shocked as uh, some of those others, uh, other parents. I mean, my heart, my heart was racing, but, um, you have to meet people where they're at, uh, especially if you disagree with them. I think it's important to understand their communication style and as best you can understand what their experience is and why they have come to these conclusions. Um, because a lot of times then you can find common ground. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that is, is happening and, and it happens, uh, and it has been happening a lot, uh, recently, uh, especially in the wake of the pandemic, uh, is, is understanding that streets, um, are, are more than for just driving fast in a, in a, in a motor vehicle. And, uh, sometimes, you know, streets are, uh, are, are designed for carrying surfboards. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> this is, uh, Viva streets. Number two. Number two. Uh, yeah, two it, it was, four. it was a, it was a rainy day. This was the June <laughs> Viva streets and you guys got rained out. Now May was kind of damp too, right? It, it was damp also mother's yeah. day yeah. morning. These are my kids uh, yeah. messing around with the <laughs> megaphone. Um, my daughter, uh, we started getting a little delirious here at the, this is the, the June Viva streets. Um, we were, there were some runners coming by and we were yeah. announcing them as, as if they were like running a marathon, winning it. Oh, I, and uh, I, 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 I want to show this because I mean, when we say it was wet, it was uh-huh. wet. It was coming so down. Wet, so <laughs> wet. It rained like this, like pouring rain. So unlike Denver, um, yeah. I thought it would never happen for, on the second Beva Streets, but it was worse yeah. on the second one yeah. than it was on the first one. I haven't um, seen this. I'm going to press play on this. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh this yeah. is just the this water is, running <laughs> in the street. Water running into the drain. I mean, the, wow. it, <laughs> it was oh. so wet like this until about, uh, 1130 in the morning. Yeah. Um, I couldn't believe the water and I was so disappointed because I had, um, I had some games planned for some fun games. uh, Some of the same games that we've done at the, our own bike rodeo. Um, you can see that people did start to come out as the rain let up and, um, unfortunately they, they ended up just calling it, I think to uh, spare some of the volunteers, uh, I don't know, spirits, I guess. Yeah, no, no. And and you have to do that. Now, refresh my memory. You're you're not going to be around for the July Viva Streets. Is that correct? You're going to be off uh, playing and doing vacation stuff? Uh Uh-huh. I will be camping off the grid. um, But I'm going to come back uh, a little bit early for for the August one. And I'm going to have some of those games that I plan to do at at the June Viva Streets. We'll have, uh, I think, about 35 hula hoops left to decorate. Um, and, uh, maybe we'll have an MC. I've thrown out some other ideas for, for July. Um, I have a lot of prizes to give away too, cause I, I purchased gift cards up and down Broadway at those businesses to give away as volunteers or as, um, uh, prizes. Nice. Yeah. So I will be at Viva streets oh, in July, July, but not August. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Well, I, might be I back. invite you, I invite you to come back for August, uh, because yeah. I will have that megaphone, not my daughter. Okay. And, uh, we'll be doing some fun, uh, competitions, skills course. Um, yeah. if you dare. Yeah. Yeah. A donut, donut relay. Also, I have donut trophies, uh, yeah, yeah. that I've already 3d printed. Well, I, I absolutely love, um, documenting Viva Streets and Open Streets events. Um, for the past several years, I've, I've documented uh, the Open Streets events uh, up in Fort Collins. I've got, again, several years worth of, of video uh, footage that I've shot up there in Fort Collins. And this is the reason why. I mean, again, it reframes what streets are for. 
Because so much of what we in North America have been scripted to believe is that a street is only for the fast movement of motor vehicles. And that's really not what streets are for. I mean, streets have been around for literally thousands of years where motor vehicles only became, you know, prevalent in the last 100 years. And so understanding that uh, a street is is not only a place for movement, for, you know, transport, for mobility of getting from one place to the other, but it's also a social place. It's it's the platform for building wealth. It's where commerce has, has traditionally happened uh, for, for thousands of years. And so it's wonderful to see more and more cities uh, getting engaged in doing open streets events and being able to do this because I do believe that it helps reframe subtly I know it's only an event, maybe it's once a year, maybe it's, you know, uh, several times during a summer, uh, unless you're <laughs> down in Bogota and you do it every Sunday. Uh, but but it, my point is, is that it helps to, to reframe that, oh yeah, that's right, streets can be more than just a place where we're supporting uh, fast moving traffic and uh, an automobile uh addiction (laughs) that that sort of you know that 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 you know car centric car brain sort of approach of drive everywhere for everything it's like oh yeah yeah, it's not that far we it's a nice day let's let's walk let's bike yeah yeah that's I, i that is something that i try to um push on people do it just do it when you can just try it out um bike to work day today is about just trying it out try it once or twice do it every friday do it you know on the weekend to the farmer's market um give it a try because i do feel like when you have that especially for children when you have those happy experiences with your family or with your friends riding to um you know Friday night pizza dinner or riding down to the the playground, like experiencing that, that freedom of being able to go places before you can, um, before you're old enough to really go far. Uh, my 14 year old is in that position right now. He's able to ride his bike to his friend's house. Uh, he's constantly going down to the playground. And I hope that that rush, that feeling, the positive feeling of, of having that independence on his own two feet or on his own two wheels. I hope that sticks with him and that he continues to, to value that, the mode outside of uh, a vehicle as he grows up. Yeah. And that's so incredibly important. It's one of the things that we see and I've documented over in the Netherlands and also in Denmark as well. And for that matter, in Sweden and and Norway, is that we are seeing that when you have a safe and inviting all ages and abilities uh, environment out there where you know, kids can get around under their own power, whether it's walking, whether it's biking, whether it's using transit, you're able to establish a, uh, a sense of efficacy of being able to navigate through your own community, your own space. They're able to actually make that transition into young adulthood and adulthood much more successfully, uh, because they, they are, do have that sense of independence and sense of self-confidence that they can, that they do know how to get around under their own power. They can get to school on their own. They can get to after school activities. They can get to their friends' places. Um, and it, it's so incredibly empowering when I interview parents, or, you know, in those types of environments, they're just like, oh yeah, I mean, it, we couldn't do what American mm-hmm. parents are doing. I mean, that, that would just be, you know, so stifling and, and, and it's not healthy for the kids either. No, no, for sure not. Um, I was on a safe routes to school, uh, online conference last year and, uh, what city, I think it's in Portland. I'm not sure. And I believe her name is Megan. Um, she, she does a, a biking school bus. So maybe it's not, maybe it's Seattle. Um, oh yeah. Megan Ramey, um, up yeah. in, uh, in hood river. Yeah. So she, yeah. she does, she's the bike train conductor up there and yeah. she's now the safe routes to school person up in hood river. Yeah. But I believe it's her that runs a, what she calls an eighties club, um, mm-hmm. at a middle school. Mm-hmm. And cause I've been in, as my kids get older, I think, okay, well, um, 
you know, bike rodeo may not be as appealing to the, you know, middle and high school age right. groups. So, you know, how does safe routes to school work um, with that age group? And I love the 80s club that I think Megan runs where it's it's really a, a disguise for a walking group and the kids get together and they just simply walk, uh, walk or ride transit to uh, or, or bike to places that they get to pick themselves and then they plan right. out the route. Um, I think that's fantastic. And, and kids that age just like eat that up, being able to go someplace on their own, make their own decisions right. um, and just full of life lessons there uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I pulled you away from bike to work day. Uh, we're recording this here on Wednesday, June 28th. Uh, and uh, I, I, I love reframing things and, and uh, especially given the fact that so many people aren't aren't working in a traditional environment anymore. So I love reframing bike to work day as, as bike uh, anywhere and everywhere day. Uh, but what was it like this morning uh, there in Denver? Um, it was great. I told somebody we should have iced coffee, not hot coffee everywhere because it just got hotter and hotter, but oh, yeah. not as hot as uh, the day before. Um, it was fun. I mean, I just, I love, it's like having a welcoming committee uh, every few blocks as you ride past yeah. or stop at all the, the breakfast stations. Um, it's, it's just a really fun day. Uh, yeah. I love to see more cyclists out there. It, it feels good when there's more of you. Uh, it feels good yeah. when you're riding past people sitting in cars in traffic. It was fun. Uh, we started off at uh, Union Station. My husband and I started at Union Station today because our kids jumped on a train with their cousins to go to um, Glenwood Springs, which I highly recommend that train trip for anybody listening. Beautiful yeah. scenery. Fantastic. Yeah, that is a beautiful uh, route uh, that basically parallels much of I-70 through through the mountains. And, and uh, yeah, especially in that portion of uh, when you start getting close to Glenwood Canyon. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the other thing that I'd like to emphasize, too, about this type of event is that, and it came out in my video that I produced this year of Austin's Bike to Work Day, uh, which was in May. Um, in fact, that's nationally, that's usually when it's held is in May. Uh, Colorado is one of the states that has shifted it to June just from a weather perspective. Um, good thing it wasn't pouring down rain <laughs> for oh, this okay. one. Um, but one of the things I like to emphasize, though, is that, um, and, and like I said, it did come out when I was interviewing people um, on the ground, uh, you know, this year, is that they, you know, many of them were working from home. That's where they work. They, they don't actually need to ride their bike to work. And, uh, but one of them, her quote was like, this is the best day ever. This is my favorite day of the year. And I'm like, well, why? And she's just like, because of what you said, it's fun to be able to, to ride around through the city with a group of other people and, and not feel like you're, you're, you're the only one, because that's one of the things that does end up happening is that, um, we're so spacious, space efficient when we're on a bicycle that, you know, you can literally fit tens of thousands of people on bikes in a bike lane. And that's one of the reasons why bike lanes so often look empty is because we're so space efficient. We don't take any up anywhere near as much space as a, a massive SUV. Um, and so it, it, it is a wonderful thing to, to, to be able to get out there with other folks. But the other real most important aspect of this type of day is that it gives an opportunity to support others who, you know, they just they don't know how to go about it. And so this is where veterans who do bike to work or bike everywhere, you know, for all their errands or whatever can help support and say, Hey, let's, let's get you set up. Let's, we'll all ride into the office together. And it, it helps, it helps allay some of the fears that exist within people who, um, you know, may not have never, you know, have felt comfortable being able to ride, uh, to work or to the grocery store or whatever. So that's what I love about this day and what, why it's so special is it helps support people and give some uh, confidence to them that it can be done. Yeah. Biking and walking is contagious. It is. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, absolutely. Active mobility, active towns. That is what it is all about. Amy, is there anything that we haven't yet talked about that you really want to leave the audience with? Yeah, I would say I would oh, love we, to. We got it. We got to do this, though. Let's let's what? end with this, Amy. <laughs> Let's what? end with Pixel Monsters. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> what? My All right, so, so this is going to be our final segment here uh, of, of our interview. What's Pixel Monsters all about? <laughs> well, um, like I said, I like to use my uh, graphic design skills in combination with uh, bike advocacy or activism and... Um, this is a little poem that explained what was going on in the street. Fun pixel monsters remind drivers we all share streets are for people. Um, this was some um, artwork that we did to the shared streets. Um, there's Emily working on uh, the final details. People started embellishing beyond uh, what the stencils uh, allowed. And so we painted these pixel monsters um, along two, I think, 16th and 30th Avenue shared streets, um, maybe probably 25 volunteers over a couple of days. Um, this was during the pandemic, uh, the heart of the pandemic. So you can still see some masks there. Not too long after the Alexis Bounds um, a memorial artwork was done to those streets. These are, this is a photo by Rob Toftis. Uh, he takes really good photos. Um, but the, a super fun project just to remind people to have fun and remind drivers that there are people out here in the street that um, it can be a space for connecting with others. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the fact that uh, that 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 pixel monster, that very first one, you know, had the the streets are for people uh, on there. That's that that is fantastic. Um, I don't know if you know that uh, that is like one of my uh, my taglines for for active towns. Is, oh, I did not know are for that. People. Yes, that makes absolutely. a lot of sense. I love that. Um, and and what's really what's really fun is um, I. I don't tend to be snarky um, much at all, um, but in some of the artwork that I've put together uh, out on the Active Town store um, is some graphics uh, associated with, um, with with streets are for people, and yeah. and uh, one of the things that that I've done is um, is create a shirt that sort of is a play off of. Um, the the old tricks uh, commercial uh, tricks are for kids uh -huh. yeah you know and yeah. so i i came up with uh, um, uh some some you know streets are for people shirt so my standard streets are for people shirt is is this shirt here uh -huh. but uh one of my favorite streets are for people uh shirt is is the following is is that uh, you know silly motorists don't you know Streets are for people. <laughs> That's right. Make it fun. I mean, you you can't. It can't all be punches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for yeah, sure. That's good stuff. Amy, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's Thanks it's been such a pleasure me. chatting with you. I'm devastated that you're not going to be at the the Viva Streets in July, but I'm great, absolutely uh, grateful that we were uh, able to ride together a couple Saturdays ago for the Ride for Racial Justice, and uh, just so stoked to have you here on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Amy. And if you did, please remember, give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, please just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider becoming an Active Towns Ambassador. You can support me on Patreon, buy me a coffee, uh, YouTube super thanks right down below, as well as making a donation to the nonprofit and buying things from the Active Town store. Every little bit helps and is much appreciated. Thank you all so much and we'll see you soon. This is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.